Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. It's uh, Roxanne Dermach. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Uh, today I have a special new colleague, and uh, Oliver and, and I just um, are, are part of a new mastermind, uh, which I feel very, very privileged to be involved with. And Oliver is um, has done some fascinating work. Um, uh, he's been in the field of leadership. I'm going to say leadership consulting for well over. We don't want to date you now, Oliver, but over 25, 30 years. And um, he's, I'm going to say, focusing on an area that um, we're seeing a lot more of uh, lately in the business consulting world, which is stepping out from the top, where senior leaders kind of are, are finding that next step about, so now what? I've I've worked very really hard. I've, I've uh, created this space of maybe started a little legacy with the company that I'm with. And so like now, what do we do? So Oliver, thanks so much for coming in today to chat with us. My pleasure, Roxanne. So let's, let's t- tell me a little bit about you and kind of your path. And were you always wanting to do um, leadership uh, development or leadership consulting work? Was that kind of the thing you went to uni for? Or was it something that you kind of found along the way. I I think, you know, like many long careers, it makes sense looking back, but it wasn't planned in the way it turned out. So I actually started my career as a social worker. I I then ran an experimental unit, which was the first direct alternative to custody for serious and persistent young offenders. So instead of locking them up to work with them more, more constructively in a therapeutic community, and From that, ended up about three steps later in leadership development and um, was director of leadership consulting for Penna PLC, which is one of the big consultancies in the UK. Um, And I'm now in my second encore career, so I can tell you a bit more about that. Well, amazing. I didn't know, you know, if I I heard that at our call, I must have missed it. So that's interesting because our paths have been Mm. kind of similar uh, with me starting frontline. I think I shared that, um, you know, as a psychotherapist, I started with the frontline with the police. That was my very, very first job as a new grad. And uh, talk about learning a lot of skills, really, you know, cat on a hot tin roof and learning how to assess and uh, um, connect and relate to people. Uh, that was something that I found that I had to learn really quickly. Uh, now I have the degree, now what do I do kind of thing. So let's let's talk about, um, the concept is the Goldilocks complex that we're, you know, Oliver and I thought we would have a chat about here you are, you know, and most senior leaders, they maybe found their way, like Oliver has talked about meandering and finding your spot in senior leadership and you're passionate and you have a trajectory and you know where you, you, you know, you kind of go, oh, I like this or oh, I don't like this. And you find your path and you, you, you know, you create an, a, an amazing career. And the question becomes, when do you decide it's time? It's time to transition um, out. When is it too early? And Oliver um, shared a paper with us that we can also share with you. And when is it too late? When, what is the sweet spot? And that's what our conversation is gonna be about today. So Oliver, tell me a little bit about what made you want to focus on this thin edge of the wedge? Um, well, I suppose a few answers to that. One is um, I turned 70 in August. So um, I'm the living, living, breathing example of you have to step out at some point and it makes sense to do it intelligently as well. So I'm on my second encore career. So I finished as director of uh, leadership consulting in Penna. I then set up my own coaching practice, which I did for five years um, and loved it. And that's that was always my first love all the way through my career. Coaching was the thing I loved to do most. 
Um, but I was in Panama City and I was about to go on the platform with 300 people in the audience and it was delayed for 10 minutes because the chief executive of the company wanted to introduce some new stuff so I'm waiting for 10 minutes and I was looking around and I thought I'd been in you know week one we'd been in India week two the Philippines week three uh, uh, US week four etc so we'd been going around the world doing this and I suddenly thought suddenly thought because I hadn't made my mind before when am I going to stop doing this I still I loved it but two things one when is, is there a point comes when I am past my sell by date because if there is a point that that's the case I want to have stepped out before that I don't want other people to be saying he really should have stepped out last year because he was great before that um and so I was I didn't think I was close to that but I wanted to, to be mindful of that and the second thing was by being so passionate about my career that all the other things I wanted to do, I wasn't doing because I was so that was so all encompassing. So, um, you know, travel and collecting and writing and et cetera, et cetera. So I just decided there and then that I would retire from that. But I wasn't totally finished with professional because there's nothing I like more than this and coaching conversations or whatever uh, and I've been doing a lot of work with the the senior people that you had described who were thinking about and preparing to leave from successful big positions and I thought that's that's work that still needs to be done I like doing it so I set up um, stepping out from the top team which is the um in which we provide coaching to people with those with that dilemma and in that position. And we also do some advisory work with organizations around how do you create a safe environment for senior leaders, which is my focus, to be able to step out successfully. So that's sort of what, what has got us to here. And it's been um it's been like most of these things, it's been a, a really rich journey of discovery because the more people that you work with the more people you talk to the more dimensions to this that you find so the goldilocks dilemma as you say is for any senior leader and actually any professional coming to a point where they go i need to think about the future and when will i step out and um, you can step out too early which means you leave before your job is done um i had i spoke to one chief executive who um, who said, I said, what's it like being the chief executive of this complex, difficult organization of which he was wonderfully successful? And he thought for a long time, he said, you know, it feels like the bridges to every other part of my life are burning, which is a very powerful. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, the bridge to my family, the bridge to my wife, the bridge to my children, the bridge to my health, the bridge to my well-being. Those are all burning, and if I don't do something, we'll collapse. And he, his response to that was to put his resignation in very quickly, okay, and left before the job was completed. It would have been so much better, and he, I'm saying that because he said this to me later on, if I'd had the chance to really think this through and plan it. And I could have extended my tenure if I'd done certain things. So that's leaving too early. Leaving too late is I, I worked with um, uh, Margaret, I'll call her, who um, had a reputation for I will be retiring in 18 months time and always will be. Right? <laughs> because she kept moving the date of the 18 months and it was causing huge frustration below her but it was also damaging her reputation and she, it felt like she was hanging on like the unwanted last guest at the party mm. right um and then there are people who can get it just right i'm working with one person at the moment i'll, I'll call him tony who is really focused on finishing what he's doing well but he's also got this wonderful adventure of painting as a professional, writing professionally, becoming a non-executive director, um, uh, working as a coach. So he's created this really rich basket of 
different activities. And he's going to spend the first year just sampling those, experimenting with them, and then he'll create what it is. That, to me, is leaving just right. And he's also worked with his organisation as when is the right time? What do I need to finish before I go on whatever? So that's that's the, uh, the, the Goldilocks dilemma. And I suspect where our focus might be today is on how do you get it just right? Mm, absolutely, because let's 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 talk about the um, the trajectory of the executive, right? Mm. So you know you start and you have all these aspirations. When should when is a pivoted time or a time that's in the life cycle of that executive? How do you know, right? Because like you you might be building, yeah, um, and all of a sudden you get there because the the goal is achieved, and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm there too early. Um, is it that they start thinking about it at that point, Oliver, or is it, is it there are different, because I'm thinking if you're building, 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 um, and there's going to be a nice crest where you want to be able to deliver, and then you're going to find that, but sometimes you don't know when that's going to come along. So should executive coaching start earlier with the Goldilocks kind of perspective? Yeah. I mean, I think there are lots of different triggers to this. And it's probably about listening to your own thinking to know when my the short answer is as early as possible within reason. OK, so I work with lots of people who are 10 years out from when they, they they're going to finally sort of step out. But they want to make sure that they're in the best position they can be. So they're working at it really early. I have others who um, have like three years to go and they're starting it then. I have worked with people who've got six weeks to go. That becomes quite a challenge. But um, a lot can be done in six weeks to help the person, you know, to make it successful or whatever. So I think the short answer is as early as possible within reason. And the triggers... I think the thing is to listen for is if it's an internal thing, it's about when does the when does the golden ladder become a golden hamster wheel? Mm. I, I, like, I like that. When does the golden ladder become a golden hill? So internally, we're talking about the, the leader um, or the executive going inside to really start reflecting on he or she wants um, going mm -hmm. forward. Because a lot of times, you know, and you know, senior leaders, they're driven. A lot of times they focus a lot, unfortunately, sometimes to the detriment of the other kind of systems in their life. Yeah. They focus on work a lot and things start to fall apart. Or maybe they, they don't tend to some of the things that they need to. Um, so at that point, if they're kind of circling the same things and not connecting with themselves is that's, that's, I think that's a fascinating dilemma because I, if I'm thinking I'm in my say forties or whatever, and my children are young and I'm not seeing them, let's say, cause I'm traveling so much. And the only dilemma in my mind is I love what I'm doing, but my, my children are escaping <laughs> from my purvey. Like pretty soon yeah. I don't like slow myself down because they're not going to slow down. I'm going to miss that yeah. entire life stage. Right. And, and I work with, and I've worked with a number of people who go, I now want to redress the balance. Mm -hmm. And I tend to go, well, that's great. You want to spend more time with your children, but do they want to spend more time with you now? Because <laughs> you can't get that time back. You might no. you might do stuff to be with them. Uh, but I know if I announced to, I, I, I'm very lucky I've got twins. Uh, they're now 35. Mm -hmm. um, and if I suddenly announced to them and said, I know you're going to be that I'm going to spend more time with you. I'd be really interested in what the response would be. It wouldn't be, oh, just, thanks very much, Dad. That's what we're waiting for. You know, so it's, you know, those are the things. That are, so that idea, and I think for a lot of senior leaders, because it's a, it's it has wonderful rewards. It can be a really fascinating thing, but it does come with, there's a weight comes with it, and there are choices that come with it, and there are, uh, sacrifices that come with it and for a lot of people they just get to the point of going this I used to get up and feel excited about this it just feels as if I'm having to run on the hamster field very and I'm not getting any satisfaction from it or starting not to I think other triggers are um when it's not you decides 
But when the organize, you start to get messages in the organization that maybe you're not the right person, which was never the case before. And I think that links to things like ageism, which we might talk about later on, because that's um, to me, it's the last discrimination that dares to speak its name. I mean, people will have opinions about what age people are past their cell by date, which is totally unacceptable uh, and doesn't bear scientific research, you know, sort of uh, contemplation, but it's still nevertheless there. And the other thing that's a trigger very often, and I mean, people can decide to step out at any age, but a lot of people, it's in, when they're 50 something, they start thinking about it. And there's a number of things about being 50 something that is worth consideration. First of all, we are probably, for most people, they're nearing the top of their career curve. Yeah. Okay. So if you're nearing the top, what is it you do next? Are you just going to continue that or whatever? And you probably know enough to go, there isn't another promotion for me if that's what you're interested in or whatever. Um, at the same time, you're at the, at the bottom of your happiness curve, which is the, the, the research that I've certainly read about it is that at that sort of mid 50s, we are we can we are at our most likely to be unhappy. But the good news is we just get happier again as we live a bit longer. But at that point, so just as we're reaching the top of our career trajectory, we're hitting a low point in our, our mood and whatever. And we, you know, we could discuss the relevance of that and, and whether that's right by the research. Um, and then ageism kicks in and we start to get messages mm -hmm. that say, well, maybe people you know, by the time you reach the end of your 50s, maybe you are past yourself by date. There is there is no sensible logic to that that I can see now. If you look at um, the stuff in terms of acuity, creativity, ability to work hard, physicality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there is no reason that anybody in a healthy society is past their cell by date by their 50s. So all of these things start to happen. And I think I had one example of it. I, I was working with a woman and she was a senior executive and she was struggling with a really sort of naughty problem, something that was really difficult to work her way through. And she was getting frustrated by it. And I was, was helping her. And at one point she said, I can't work this out. Maybe it's just because I'm 62. Mm. And I went, hold on a minute. <laughs> Let me put my provocational hat on here and go, what, what brings you to say that? Right. And then as she talked about it, she went, actually, I'm just, I was just verbalizing the messages I'm getting that women, by the time they get to their late fifties are past their cell by date. And then the menopause has impacts on that and stuff as well. So she had created her own crisis, but it was triggered by those other things. So there's multiple reasons. So, um, you know, but my point is pay attention to the thinking that you're doing. And if you're coming to the point, going, I need to start thinking and planning how to do this well, then that's the time to start. You know, you make it's also, sorry, like Roxanne, one other thing, it's also very, very helpful if you have enough sense to start making investments in a pension or in other things way before that, because it makes it a lot easier. Absolutely, because I think of my trajectory. So I was an executive um, until I, and I, the company was changing. So I would be, <laughs> I, I was in the tumbleweed, um, mm. but I was busy, right? So I was raising a young family and I was like, oh, okay, I think I want to get out. This is me, this is my internal dialogue. Okay, this isn't fitting where I want to be, but I, I'm going to look, I'm going to look. And then, um, there was one last major acquisition and I, you know, when you know, but you're like, yeah. okay, I'm yeah. just going to keep going. And, um, and then I got a severance, which I was, you know, lucky and stuff. Mm. And, you know, there was lots of other things that I wanted to do, but it, what it, at 44 years old, I was like in your early category, I was like, okay, mm. so like, what do I want to do when I grow up? This is what I'm thinking. <laughs> And then I thought, somebody said, well, why don't you just work with a, you know, work with a, a business executive coach and then figure it out. And luckily, I was able to take that step. And now we're talking 12 years out. I was able to do that transition. Yeah. I was, you know, coming, but I wasn't, I wasn't looking at the side because I was just so busy. But I, yeah. can, I can see how, you know, at that age, if you're like thinking, am I past my sale? Like you're, 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 uh, Kind of sale date, like you said, then what do you do, right? Because you're thinking mm. you're at a tier level, 
now you don't now you don't have a job <laughs> and now you're like yeah. what do I do and luckily there was things that I still wanted that I love to do yeah. and started to explore so I'm sure there's a lot of people that go through that and I know there was a lot of people at my level um, that went through the same thing that struggled immensely a lot of uh, mental health and depression and because we stay connected obviously yeah. on our professional platforms and let's talk a little bit about that like finding I was talking about it in my new book I talk about what is my legacy imprint that I want to leave behind mm -hmm. and I wonder when you're dealing with these the senior executives that do well are these ones that have kind of really thought through what other things in their life that they also want to experience as they're in their career? Are those people having a, a better time through this versus the people that are kind of just work-driven? I think, as always in this, there's a spread. And there are that group of senior leaders, like every other population, who are who are very emotionally in tune with themselves mm -hmm. and are naturally reflective and and think about why am I on the planet you know what is it I want to to be what is it I want to have achieved uh by the time I'm leaving the planet so there are people who are really very well thought through it doesn't funny enough it doesn't mean that they don't have challenges at this point of work of where I make a reality you've then got at the other end uh, people who've been so busy being senior leaders that they've never stopped to think at all about those other things. Um, I had um, uh, I was in a group of senior leaders, and one of the the he was a partner in in a very big um, accountancy firm, and um, he said, "I went home and announced to my wife and said." Darling, I'm coming home after 30 years. They said, I didn't get the response I was expecting. <laughs> and this is great. Yeah, you know, and and um, I'll not include all the expletives of what she said to him. And, that you know, when you've been away, I've created a life for myself. Don't think you're coming back into, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but and he was he was lovely and lighthearted the way he did it. But in conversations after him, he was completely unthought through mm. because he had been so focused on being a partner and being successful now that I'm, it's not my job to make judgments on that but it was in a different it was a different agenda that that needed to be covered so people are at all sorts of 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 different points and and because it's a transition mm -hmm. so in my experience and the people I've worked with 15% it's pretty straightforward. I know what I'm doing at the moment. I know when I'm going to leave and I know what I'm going to do after that. So the 80 per, 85%, it's, I sort of know where I am and I, I'm not quite sure when I'm going to leave. And I have, I have some ideas, but I have no idea what I'm going to do afterwards. And I need to invest in the thinking around that and the, um, the reflection around that in order to create a way to move forward with confidence. And for a, I'll, I'll tell you the reason why a lot of people, in my experience, get stuck and don't move forward. And those are the ones who end up overstaying and welcome, leaving too late. The first one is they haven't worked out their finances. I, I spoke to one who happened to be a, a, an audit partner in one of the big firms. And I said to him, do you know the value of your investments? Or, or I said, do you, under, sorry, do you understand your investments? And he said, yes, I do. I've got this amount of millions in because he was exceptionally well paid. Um, you know, in this one, I said, that's not the question. It's do you understand? He said, what do you mean? He said, do you understand how that will support the lifestyle of your choice for the rest of your life? And at 55, um, on, on the modern statistics, you have a more than 50% chance of living to 90 plus, right? If you retire at 60, that's another third of your life. Do you actually understand your finances well enough? Everyone that I've asked, I've worked with about 190 people. Um, 
in this process. And every person I've asked who says, yes, I understand my finance and thought it through, are going ahead to make to make plans to move it forward. Every single person that said, no, I don't really understand that is stuck. And they keep talking about having actually done anything about it so that's that's one of the things that, that that sort of gets in the way another one is people facing up to the change in their identity and i don't know if you're if in the audience today people will know the, the children's character postman pat very popular in the uk but postman he's a mailman and it's his adventures children's adventures in the deals in england uh, and there's nothing about what do you call postman pat when he's no longer a postman just Pat. Yeah. What do you call a, a managing director when she is no longer a managing director? And a lot of people find that a really challenging thing to even think about because it's a change of identity and they've built a long time getting to that identity um, and a number of other things as well. So it's 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 helping people to get to the point, and I love it when people go, Right, I'm now ready to plan the adventure ahead. Most professionals, certainly most senior leaders that I work with, have never settled for mediocrity. Right. Why would they start settling for mediocrity now? But yet that's what I very often, and that sense of going, how are you going to make the next, the last third of your life extraordinary? What is that going to be to get that? It's a little bit like when, when you listen, when I listen to people, one of the things I listen for is, People are either coming in to land in the arrivals hall, right? Which is they're bringing things to a close. For other people who are in the departure lines going, right, this is the opportunity for liberation to give and actually take off to new adventures. I love it when people move from the arrivals hall to the departure lines because that's where the real excitement and inspiration comes. And that's an amazing thing to think about, because I think if we think of traditional retirement, whatever that was, say, mm. about 30 years ago compared to now, is that we're finding a lot of people wanting to do that much more. Right? Like you said, with if you retire at, say, you know, 60 or 55, and then you're going to live another 30, 30 35 years, that's a whole yeah. other lifetime. Yeah. And generally, we think of, and I know with, um, you know, with benefits consulting, the traditional kind of we, you know, you retire and within five to seven years, the trajectory isn't, hasn't been good for a lot of people that didn't figure it out because if they hadn't developed things, then they maybe, you know, get sick and they, you know, they may pass away, right? They, we know that from insurance benefits consulting yeah. and how they do that trajectory. But and it's that, really scary. It is scary, right? So it's about embracing that. And even me, now I'm going to be 57 in January. Um, and then I'm talking about all these things that I want to do, but I find my some of my um, people around me, maybe not people in the same kind of roles, are thinking about slowing down. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I have this and this and this to do. So you're having different. It's like you're having like one, mm-hmm. like you said, you're right, arrivals or departures, and nothing against people that want you know to to slow down. But sometimes you you have to find the right groups to be able to have those conversations. Because you know what, if you want to stop completely at 55, that's fantastic. But what are you going to do with that time if you do decide to retire? And if you are going to continue, how is it that you tap into, to your point, that last golden 30 years, right? Yeah. And, and the rules of the game have broken down, thank goodness. Um, I mean, in terms of retirement, retirement is a relatively new concept. It was introduced in Germany in 1881. At that stage, the retirement age was set at 70. But the life expectancy was much less than that. So most people died anyway before they ever got to that. In the United States, um, the, the retirement age was set at 65. And at that stage, life expectancy was 58. Hmm. So again, in the US, it was done, we create this retirement thing, but we expect very, very few people to get there. The retirement age has sort of stuck around 60, 65. That, now, as a, as a recognized, I know people will do it differently, but that, and yet we're living to 90 plus. 
So the whole thing is broken down. And if you look at the the, the old career model of education, career, retirement, mm -hmm. that if you look at the bit between career and retirement, there's now a bit which is post the main role that you've had and retiring, which is stopping work. And that can go on for 20 years. I'm part of that. I mean, I've been in it for 10 years and it tend to go on for quite a while longer. So we do really need to rethink this, both as a society, but also each of us individually and go, if I, it's why I use the word step, or the term stepping out rather than retiring, because you step out from the, the role you're doing and you're, and I, you're either going to retire and what does that mean? Because there's retiring and still working, retiring to a very rich leisure life, retiring to whatever, or I'm going to still, I'm going to keep working, but I'm going to work less or whatever. So it's an area that, that we don't have the concepts and the words yet familiar to help, help people think it through what it really means. So let's, let's, you know, in your, the report um, that, that uh, you're putting out, mm -hmm. it talked about companies really getting prepared. Um, and there was some data that came from that. So let's talk about some of the companies that you have been, uh, have worked with or that you know of that have done it well for that middle subset. And what kind of things are they putting in place? Or maybe what are the, um, what are the, kind of the things that they're recognizing they need to implement and they're starting to, and what is still a struggle with, with, the, with the companies that you work with? I mean, I think if, if we stand back and take it from an organizational, through, look at it through an organizational lens and quite a long term lens, there's plenty of evidence that even large companies and, and many successful companies still view, for example, a change in the chief executive or a change in the chief finance officer, a change in whatever. They treat them as one off events mm -hmm. when they're actually part of an ongoing process of of people leaving and people starting, okay? Um, and again, there's pretty good evidence that it's one of the most important things that happens in an organization. The change of a, of a senior executive affects share price, reputation, uh, buy-in from employees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and if we get, and I think it's, it's between 28 and 38%, I think it is, of senior level transitions are disappointments. Mm. Either they fail completely or they don't bring what was expected. Um, and what, that's huge. And, and they re, there, there's one Harvard statistic that um, the impact of getting transitions wrong in the top, of, in the top companies uh, equates to a trillion dollars a year. Uh, in in lost effectiveness in loss of value and whatever so it's it's a you know it's a big thing and yet today I mean and in the survey we did the very great majority of organizations are not don't have a formal approach to enabling their senior leaders to leave well and therefore create the space for the new leaders to arrive and to do that in an effective and seamless way. And a couple of, couple of um, implications of that. One is that um, if you're not careful, you're, if you pick successors, you're ripening your successors to be picked by your, your competitors because you get them ready to take over, but you don't manage the bit of when are people, the incumbents going to be leaving? So they're left hanging around, ready to go. Mm -hmm. And you've just ripened them for your competitor to go, hey, well, come and work with us because we've got... So, you know, there's a lot of damage going to be done that way. Um, and we're proposing at the moment that succession planning, it needs to be redefined. Because at the moment, I did a Google search of 20 um, definitions of succession planning. Okay, so from, you know, from Harvard through uh, a whole range of different companies and whatever, every one of them the same. It was about identifying and developing your leaders to take over. Okay, not one of them mentioned 
helping the senior leaders existent to exit gracefully and well. So it's a little bit like succession planning that is is aimed at one side of the equation and we're completely missing the other. As somebody said to me, um, it's a little bit like in an athletics relay race. We're concentrating on all our efforts on helping the person who's going to receive the baton, but we're not doing anything to help the person who's actually going to hand it over. So it it just it just doesn't make any sense. So that's why our proposition is we need to have a much more formal and thought through approach to this and enable people to leave well, feeling supported. So they leave as advocates and ambassadors. They make sure that succession is working right and whatever, and then have the people who are ready to succeed prepared and ready to take over. So you create seamless transitions. Well, if the cost, that's well, the like, business case. Yeah, of course. If that's costing you, saying it's being done poorly to the the amount of a trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And it, if you were to address it well, like you said, and there's no one particular way to do it in reference to to planning. It depends on industry and um, you know all that things. You know the demographics of your of your teams, those types of things. But starting to think about it, like you said, if as much as ten years out, which the thought of 10 years out, you know, that's a lot of people would be like, whoa, that's that's really, really soon. But with a lot, a lot of changes that happens within companies, I would think of, you know, most of the, you know, when I manage my portfolio on health and wellness, any company was in flux, 75% of my portfolio was in flux at any given point, right? So clearly there's, there's mm-hmm. constant change happening. So that's showing you that people need to plan. This was such a great interview that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. Be sure to tune in next week for part two, so you don't miss out on the amazing content. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxannederhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.